To me, that green water could be a great number of things. Aptasia, so much effort has been spent to eradicate, to despise, to hate. Yet, can we really think of an organism which has been benefiting the reef industry more yet received more scorn? As everyone knows, there's some great coral pellets out there, but not every coral readily eats when it's exposed to a pellet. A natural approach for a natural uh, desire. I hope you got all that. There will be a test at the end of this. <laughs>
these things need polyunsaturated fatty acids. The saltwater organisms cannot take inferior fuels and make them superior inside their own cell. Because they live in salt water, they must obtain the good, wholesome, direct stuff. So if we don't have that in the diet, um, that's why all of your feeds, all your high quality feeds, the first ingredient you're looking for is that whole salmon, that krill oil. That's the main good stuff. Now that's becoming more and more limited as the world is more and more dependent on anchovies and sardines and other industrial forage fisheries. So T. isochrysis is a great way for us to be able to produce that and fulfill that nutritional need without necessarily having to be dependent on very expensive and frankly inferior sources of good fats. The last one that I like is the Rhodomonas. So the Rhodomonas is actually a green algae which has stolen various different bacteria and kept them inside their cell. That's how algaes get their different colors. They steal the pigments of other organisms. And that pigment is the value. This is phycorethrin. This is the building block. You, people have heard of things like astaxanthin that give salmon fillets their good color. This is the building block of pigments. The pigments fuse with the cells of the organism that consumes it. So whether that be a copepod, all the way up to a sea bass or a trout, and they are taking all those different building blocks of the pigments, and those are the sources, all those wonderful blues, reds, all the intense colors that we see in all of our marine organisms are derived from organisms that make those pigments to capture light. When we burn an inferior fat, like let's say filler that might be in a different feed, um, there's waste, inflammation, rogue electrons. Think like rogue little sparks coming off of uh, a power head or a plug-in. And if those build up and magnify over the millions to billions to trillions, you can have issues inside your internal infrastructure. So one of the great things about these pigments is that they capture light. And what is light? It's energy. So these things are these magnets that absorb all these radical electrons associated with breaking down fuels and allow for the cells of us, for corals, for fish to eat, grow, intensify, while at the same time kind of being stabilized. Each one of these things contributes not only direct and profound nutritional contributions to the organisms that eat them, but are also contextualized by a biology of their own cells and the cells of the bacteria around them. A natural approach for a natural uh, desire. I hope you got all that. <laughs> there will be a test at the end of this. <laughs> I guess to bring it down, let's land the plane here. Yeah into the hobby. How are we using each one of these in the hobby now? So there are three main applications for phytoplankton inside the reef hobby. The first is broadcast feeding. There are several organisms that frankly have not been accessible to the hobby for the longest time because they have been smashed into a wall of what we can offer them. Not everything can eat a powdered inept feed. Some things like non-photosynthetic corals need to be eating live cells. It's what they are designed to do. And if you want success with these organisms, you want and need to be able to offer them live phytoplankton and rotifers and other zooplankton that are rich with that nutrition. Second is the enhancement of other feeds. You, as everyone knows, there's some great coral pellets out there, but not every coral readily eats when it's exposed to a pellet. A couple milliliters of some of these phytoplankton can be an incredible garnish, if you will, to trigger that initial feeding response so that the rest of the food can be consumed better. The third major way is for sustainable aquaculture. There isn't pretty much any organism minus live bearers that can be produced without rearing at least one form of these algae. And, but by rearing these algae, anyone from a, a research lab at a university down to a commercial uh, commercial aquacultural enterprise down to the home hobbyist can introduce a critter and breed it for the first time in captivity to close the life cycle and actually produce it sustainably. That can only be done when you start from the ground up nutritionally. So there are many exciting ways that algae can satisfy both the past needs of the hobby and advance it into a new glorious sustainable future. Does uh, Top Shelf Aquatics offer do you guys offer these yet at retail? Yes, yeah, so the way we do it right now is one of these jugs from each of the different species will be fed out into our various systems per day to enhance uh, the coral feeding and also bump up the zooplankton populations. And the cream of the crop that I like the best gets bottled up and is available for both retail purchase, the retail store, and uh, for direct harvest being shipped overnight. High quality, on tap, 24-7. I think we all need a Taras in our life. <laughs>
This isn't the only thing that you are over though. You've got some other things here in the farm and I, I would like to, you know, call everybody's attention to the Aptasia farm that you have <laughs> here. <laughs> of course. So one of the other reasons I was brought in was uh, there was a desire here at Top Shelf to sustainably offer larger, more consistent quantities of Bergia. So um, the first thing that we have to do is for every production tank we have of the target species, we have to have at least twice the volume dedicated to producing their food. This is simply the way nature works. Not only are we getting a more consistent, clean, pest-free supply of Aptasia for our Bergia production, but the very idea of it, Aptasia, so much effort has been spent to eradicate, to despise, to hate, yet, can we really think of an organism which has been benefiting the reef industry more yet received more scorn? This is the model organism that scientists were able to keep inside their labs. They have given us the fundamental understanding which has translated us into every advancement that's allowed us to keep corals. The Aptasia, though they are a pest and I dedicate my efforts to eradicating them with my Volk packs. That's what I call the bird here. So <laughs> I can't help but have uh, grown uh, an admiration for them. It's amazing how difficult it is to produce large concentrations of Aptasia in any particular spot when you want to. It can be a trick, especially when you need about 100 a day to support your hungry wolves. Yeah. And you need them in various sizes. Plus, I needed a place to keep my saltwater mollies, and this is the beginning of our a grow out for those, too. So Very cool. I'm a big fan of uh, underappreciated critters. Well, if anybody has Aptasia and you want to send it to Top Shelf Aquatics, I'm sure. Raskin. It won't be going to a good place, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, do you want to take us to uh, what else you got going on? I know you got sure. pods and yes, things like yes, that. Yes, 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 yes. I'll be a little bit arcane, but this is my copepod corridor at the moment. We have three different species of actual copepods that we have available. The Apo Cyclops penimensis. But you see, this is a free oh, yeah. swimming copepod. This specializes in eating things like bacteria and algae that are in the water column. Down here, we have the Tisbe benemiensis. A little bit harder to see, but up against the glass, you'll see some adult organisms here. So this is a fine organism for reconciling the need to have a micro cleanup crew that can access the inner channels of schmutz in places like live rock and in the mechanical filtration, while at the same time, their larvae are free swimming and abundantly available for things like mandarin dragonettes and seahorses that will be hovering around these structures looking for essentially a big stuffed lobster dinner to whack. We have our Tigriopus californicus, a little bit of a bigger harpacticoid copepod, um, but one that provides a much more substantial feeding opportunity for these zooplankton feeders. And you can see an adult here. This culture just got split, so it's a little bit thin today. But. So what would you say as far as like size comparison with each one of these species, is this the smallest? You'd have them? Moina at the top being okay. the biggest. Then you have baby Moina. Then right around between baby Moina and adult Moina, you'd have the adult tigger pod. And then below tigger pod would be Apocyclops adult. And then there would be a Tisbe benemiensis adult. And then the Noplii, which is like the caterpillar form of the copepods, would all be way down here, well beyond the scope of human vision. Now, something that flirts with that line between human vision and the beginning sizes of the adult copepods are the rotifers. We'll go see them next. So these are my trash cans that I keep in the back. Um, they're just simple, easy, clean, cheap to use. So the rotifer species that we raise here is the Branchionis plicatilis or the L-strain rotifer. It is a larger species of rotifer that prefers estuarine waters, but it produces a nice moderate sized package for suspension feeding corals. And you mirror that with its ability to double every couple days and its ability to mow down algae like uh, goats in a field. Uh, it can be a very uh, advantageous species to keep as well. Um, for many, 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 many species of organisms, especially uh, many fish that have been bred for the first time, rotifers have been the first feed that has allowed them to be aquacultured sustainably. Um, anything that's smaller uh, has to be fed a pod baby. Well, I use these a lot whenever I was spawning clownfish. Uh, and I gotta say, I think for a hobbyist, probably one of the easiest to culture. Yes. Um, there are a few tricks like anything else, but just like everything else, I think a good hallmark of a good company that sells live feeds is that we're available to help and stand by our product enough so that if you buy a starter from us, we'll help you uh, get your own started as well. It's a sign of success. Well, Taras, I think we all feel a little bit more 
educated. I feel like we need to have you on the Reef Therapy podcast and just, we can dive deep on some of that stuff. Oh, anytime. Yeah, yeah I'd lo love to. It'd be awesome. Uh, well, um, just want to say. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to be saying, ah, ah. <laughs> Thank There's you so much. We appreciate the tour of everything you do here at Top Of course. Shop. Had a pleasure.